morning. Guys, good morning. Thank you. Hey, Reagan. Reagan waved at me. I'm, uh, I'm Matt. I'm an associate pastor here. I'm also a Spartan fan, so that is, uh, it's a good day. We are studying, goodness, did, uh, okay. We're studying the upside down kingdom. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18 and 19 and 20. We're going to be finishing up Matthew chapter 18 this morning. If, uh, if you've been here through the last couple of weeks, uh, you know that what we're looking at is Jesus and what he's teaching his listeners, what he's teaching his followers is how disciples or how believers in Jesus should interact with other believers. And it's so rich and it's so full. Pastor Peter told me last week as we were leaving, he's like, I almost just said, I'm going to turn this into a two-parter. And then when I was preparing for this week, I, like, I was thinking about recapping, and I that almost went, like, turned it into a two-parter for him. Like, there's just so much to cover. Um, but I want to say, before we begin, Jesus is talking about how we as believers relate to each other. And I just want to give a shout out to small groups and small group leaders for a moment. Uh, church, church people tell you that what gets... Uh, what gets done is what gets celebrated from, from the front. And so I want to celebrate small group leaders. I got a couple emails in the last couple weeks uh, for meals to take, whether somebody was struggling with something or a new mom, we got things to take meals. And, and Sherwin and Rachel and Lisa and Welby's small group rallied around George and Sonia as George's health was declining and he passed away. And I'm just so thankful for the way that small groups have ministered to each other. Uh, and so when, when somebody like Mitch gets up and says, like, that's the way that you connect, that's the way that we act as family together, it's not, it's not just like church ministry. It's not just something for you to do. It's, it is literally life together in the family of God. So thank you, small groups and small group leaders. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 25 in just a moment. I want to recap some of the, the things that we've been talking about. This is not what, Matt, can you switch me to the next slide? We, Jesus tells the disciples that they need to have humility like children. And if you don't have humility like children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says you cannot enter the kingdom without humility like children. And so in the upside down kingdom, the way to greatness, Jesus says, is by being humble. And then Pastor Peter talked about stumbling blocks. And Jesus says to the disciples, woe to you if you cause little ones or ones who believe in Jesus. It's not just children. It's anybody who believes in Jesus. Woe to you if you cause little ones to stumble. And he clarifies and he says, he, he taught us that that uh, stumbling is anything that would cause people to put their trust in something other than Jesus. Now, on the surface, we could say, oh, I'm not doing that, but we do that with each other all the time. We give each other these nice platitudes and, and uh, metaphors to help each other, uh, Monday motivation and all, like all these things. And it's simply not putting our trust in Jesus. So the things that we help each other along, are they causing us to put trust in Jesus? And then in the middle of that, Jesus tells this story and he says it's the kingdom of God is like a, a shepherd who leaves 99 to go pursue one who has wandered off. And we find that God is a God that doesn't want any to be cut off. And then last week, Pastor Peter talked about uh, if a brother or sister sins against you, go to them face to face. It's time in the church, that we stop saying things to each other like, someone told me, or so-and-so came to me. If that happens to you, I would like you to tell them, you need to go talk to them. Because the only thing that happens when we have third-party conversations is damaging things. It only introduces a, another narrative. We don't get any closer to clarity. We don't get any closer to actually knowing what's going on. Stop talking to each other about someone else. Go to people 
face to face. That's the only way that health is built within the family. The things that we say to each other should be strengthening and comforting and encouraging. And if it's not those things, then we need to stop. And it's simply not what Jesus teaches us to do. So that's all the recap I'm going to give you because we have too much other things to cover this morning, although we could speak uh, at length about all of those things again. So Matthew 18, verses 21 through 25, if you have your Bibles, turn there. And if you're able, please stand. Matthew 18, 21 through 25 at Eastside, we simply stand in recognition that these are God's words for us. And in this case in particular, it's Jesus teaching us about life. Matthew 18, 21 to 25. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of God is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay it, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who, who owed him a hundred silver coins or a hundred denarii. We'll talk about the amounts in a moment. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, same words that he's just spoken to the king. Be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to, uh, in Greek it just says, to the torturers here. It doesn't say anything about jail. His master handed him over to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. God, as we read these words... Uh, Uh, to forgive somebody 77 times not only seems excessive, God, it seems impossible. And so, Lord, we come to this passage this morning with the recognition that we need your help. And it is only by the help of your spirit alive within us that any of this makes any sense at all. Give us the strength and the perseverance to begin living this out by your power that is at work within us. We ask these things in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. I don't know if that was me or if that was you, but that was great. Uh, <laughs> So Peter comes to Jesus, and Peter has been following Jesus, and he knows what Jesus is like. He knows how Jesus treats people, and Peter is being generous, or so he thinks. And he comes to Jesus, and he says, how many times should I forgive somebody? Up to seven times. Now, the reason that Peter is being generous is because rabbinic teaching of the day, the, cult, the best wisdom of Jesus' day was that you should forgive someone three times, but not four and there's, there's uh, Hebrew Bible backing for that and reason for that. I'm not going to go into that this morning. But that's that was what the rabbinic teaching of, that's what rabbis at the time taught. You forgive somebody three times, but not four. So Peter comes to Jesus, and he's doubled and added one to what the brightest and the best of the culture was at the time. He comes to Jesus, and he says, 
how many times should I forgive? Up to seven times. And Jesus says, no, not seven, 77. Now, even if you're just taking this literally, that's insane. I don't like to forgive somebody once, let alone seven times. We don't even need to talk about 77 times because I, like, I cut people out of my life long before we get to 77, like usually by two. Jesus says 77 times. Now, there's a couple things to talk about here. First, numbers in Hebrew carry symbolism. And the number seven means completeness or perfection or wholeness. And so when Jesus uses 77, most people think that Jesus is saying, like, this is, there, there aren't supposed to be limits on this. There aren't supposed to be limits on your forgiveness. There isn't supposed to be a number that you get to and then you think, oh, okay, I can stop here. That's part of what Jesus is saying, but Jesus is also saying something else. Scripture is written, the, the Bible is written in, with this expectation that you've read the Bible. Now, that can be tricky, uh, especially if you're new to Christianity or new to faith because you haven't read it all. So, it's important, like it's not just meant to be read for information, it's meant to be read and studied and, and meditated upon. Now, the thing about Jesus' disciples is they probably all, as young kids, probably all memorized at least the Torah. So they know the Hebrew Bible. So sometimes when Jesus says something, it's a hyperlink to something else in Scripture. And Jesus says, mentions this 77 times. So anybody who is familiar with the Hebrew Bible would think of Lamech when they hear 77 times. Lamech is a guy that we encounter in Genesis chapter 4. And I want to give you a little background about Lamech more than what's on the screen. Uh, Cain, Adam and Eve have, a, have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. And he is banished from the Garden of Eden. And that's where this story picks up. I'm in Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, to Cain, not so. Cain, Cain is worried that when he goes out, other people are going to find him. And you know how we all get kind of nervous when a murderer moves into the neighborhood? That's what he's worried about. He's worried that he's going to move into a new neighborhood and people are going to like, oh, there's a murderer. I'm going to get him before he gets me. That's what Cain's worried about. But God says, I'm going to put a mark on you and I'm going to protect you. If anyone kills Cain, he'll suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. God is the one protecting Cain. Cain's protection is in God's hands. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Methujael, and Methujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Here we get to Lamech. Lamech is the seventh generation of human being. It doesn't say this in the text, but I think we're supposed to understand from this story, that I think there's a symbolic reason for Lamech being the seventh generation. I think that it's probably symbolic of the attitude towards which all human beings tend. Okay? I think it's the attitude towards which all human beings tend. Completeness, wholeness. I'm, I can't prove that I'm right, but I think I'm right. Ask my wife. She usually says I'm right. That's a lie. Don't ever ask her that. Lamech married two women. Lamech is the first polygamist in the Bible. Because polygamy exists in the Bible doesn't mean it's right. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of all those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. I can't get Katie Grace or Hattie outright the first time, anytime I address my children. Imagine Jobble and Jubal. <laughs> Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Here's what I want you to understand about Lamech and his descendants, Lamech and his sons. One works with agriculture and livestock, one works with musical instruments, and one works with working with metal. 
Uh, think of the resources now that are within Lamech's family. Anything he needs, anything he desires is at his fingertips. All the resources in the world at that time that you might need are within Lamech's reach. And so many people, because this is maybe the, he, he's about to give this poem. It's thought that maybe this is the oldest known poem in the world. And it's also sometimes called the the Song of the Sword, because of one of Lamech's sons, I was looking, Tubalcane, who forges uh, metal. Anyways, we finally get to this. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Why are we talking about Lamech? When Jesus is questioned about forgiveness, why do you think he mentions 77 times in a way that everybody who hears him would think of Lamech? Lamech boasts of his strength. Lamech boasts of the violence that he's committed. Lamech boasts of murder. God said that he would protect Cain. But Lamech take, takes protection and vengeance into his own hands. Lamech is saying, I'll take this on myself. I will be self-reliant. I will be self-sufficient. I will take my own destiny into my own hands. I can handle this better than God. I can handle this better than God. This is why I think that this is something towards which all human beings tend. We all have areas in our life where we think, God, I'll take it from here. And forgiveness is one of those places. So what I want to do this morning is go through a list of things about, oh, no, I'm going to recount this story. So uh, Peter asks Jesus about forgiveness, and Jesus gives an answer, and then he goes into this story. And what he, he does is he tells a parable like he usually does, and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. He begins with therefore. Jesus was active, asked about forgiveness, and he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. So this has to do with forgiveness. And Jesus goes on and he tells this story. And he tells a story about a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he comes to the first servant. And this servant owes him 10,000 talents of gold. And the servant begs and he says, please give me time. I'll pay it back. And the king has pity on him. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't cut it in half. He doesn't say, give me some of it. He doesn't say, work for part of it. He just cancels the debt. Now, we're going to get to the amounts in just a minute because it's really important to understand, but he just cancels the debt. That servant goes out, and he finds a fellow servant who owes him some money, and he begins to choke him, and he says, pay back what you owe me, and other people around them find out about it. They tell the king how the second servant treated, or the first servant treated the second servant. And the king says, why, why would you do that to your fellow servant? Now remember, Matthew chapter 18 is about how believers are relating to each other. Why would you do that to your fellow servant after I, I just canceled your debt? Why would, why would you demand that they pay a debt to you? And he's given over to torture. He's given over to torture. He had been, his debt was completely canceled, but because of his unforgiveness, he's given over to being tortured. And then Jesus finishes up the parable and he says, this is how my father will treat you unless you can forgive from your heart. Now let's, it's important that we talk about these amounts for just a second. So the first servant has a, a debt of 10,000 talents. It may say bags of gold or depending on what your, your translation is. It's, what it actually is is 10,000 talents. One talent 
One talent is 6,000 days wages. One talent is 6,000 denarii. A denarius is a day's wage. So one talent is 6,000 days wages. So Jesus said 10,000 talents. If you are good with a calculator or math, I needed a calculator. That's 60 million days wages. One commentary I read said there aren't two Greek words that you can put together that talk about a greater amount. Like Jesus is saying, this is a gajillion dollars. Like a number that we don't have. Like it's, it's all the monies, right? <laughs> 10,000 days, or t- 60 million days wages. So just to give you some perspective if you worked every day, seven days a week, if you worked every day, you would pay this back in 164,000 years. 164,000 years. You'll, pay, you'll get it paid back. Or it would take more than 3,000 people working for 50 straight years. The penalty that this man is about to receive is being sold into slavery until he can repay this debt back. Him, all that he owns, and all of his family, all of your descendants, think back up your family tree, 3,000 people. Do you know who's there? I don't. That means that you will be your, everybody who comes after you is enslaved until no one remembers who you are. And the man says, please be patient with me. I'll pay it back. No, you won't. You won't, like, you can't put a dent in the dent. Like, there is nothing that you can do to begin paying this back. There is no possible way. I don't even know how you get in this kind of debt. He goes out and he finds a man who owes him 100 denarii, right? 100 denarii. Now, again, a denarius is one day's wage. So 100 denarii is not an insignificant amount. Like, it's something. But compared to the other thing, it's nothing. And so the problem is the way that one servant treats a fellow servant Matthew chapter 18 is about the family of God, and Jesus didn't tell the disciples this parable so they'd see themselves as the king, and I don't think he told them this parable so they'd see themselves as the second servant. He told this parable so that we would all see that we're the first servant. You had a great debt, and it was paid by the king. In fact, it was just canceled. He didn't have it. He didn't quarter it. He just canceled it, and you go out, and your fellow servant and you want to choke them, and you want to throw them in jail until they pay back what they can owe. This is a parable about our hearts. I want to go through some things and talk about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. And I'm just going to, like, I want to name it now because, like, it's worth naming. Forgiveness does something for the forgiven, but this parable is told from a way that we, we look at it, we're supposed to see it from what it does to you as the forgiver, the one who extends forgiveness to your fellow servant. So most of them are from that angle. I don't usually do lists, but there was a list in a, 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 like a ministry manual thing that I read, and these are so good, and so we're just going to talk about them. Things that forgiveness is or isn't. In, specifically in this parable, we see these with the king and with the servant. So number one, forgiveness should not be confused with forgetting. I've said this before. Forgiveness is not forgetting because that requires amnesia. And that's not what, like, God doesn't expect you to go bang your head before you forgive somebody. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I think we often think that because in Hebrews, which is a, uh, in Hebrews, it's a, it's a quotation of Jeremiah 31. It, God says, I will remember your sins no more. God is not saying I have a poor memory. God is saying I'm choosing not to hold you accountable any longer for your sin. I won't 
hold you accountable. It's not that God forgot, it's that God is choosing not to hold us accountable for our sins. So forgiveness isn't forgetting, it's a choice to not hold someone accountable. It's not like the king simply forgot that he was owed 60 million days wages. He canceled it. Which leads us to number two. It's your choice to forgive. It's a decision of your will. You have to choose it. I think a lot of times I think, oh, it will come about that eventually I will be able to forgive someone. That's nonsense. The the saying time heals all wounds is it doesn't. You hear stories all the time about family that's embittered with each other and they go to their grave carrying bitterness because they've never extended forgiveness. Time doesn't heal all wounds. Jesus heals wounds. So, it's your choice. Romans 12, 19, which is a a quotation. I love that so many of these New Testament scriptures are quotations of Old Testament scriptures. In Romans 12, it gets... uh, Paul uses a quotation from God in Deuteronomy, and God says, I will avenge. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So it's not me waiting for forgiveness to come about. It's me making a choice. God will take care of avenging. Not Lamech, not Scott, not Craig, not Rachel. God will take care of avenging. Do you trust him to do that, or do you think he needs your help? I think he needs my help. Do you trust him? The king and the servant both had a choice. The king chose to cancel the debt. You owe me nothing. Now, forgiveness is not tolerance for abuse, and it's not holding, uh, it's not tolerance for abuse or sin. It's choosing not to hold people accountable any longer for that sin. Sin carries consequences, and and that's what number three is. Forgiveness is letting people off your hook, not God's. Forgiveness is letting people off your hook, not God's. When I forgive someone, it means they're no longer accountable to me for the offense that they made against me. That doesn't get them off God's hook. It gets them off my hook. It is a choice to let God be God. Sin is sin. It simply removes me from the judgment seat and allows Jesus to be the one on the judgment seat. When I choose to forgive, what I am doing, what I am saying, what I am claiming is that I no longer belong on the judgment seat. Jesus does. Number four. You forgive others. This is something that I think that we don't fully understand most of the time. You forgive others for your sake so you can be free. Now, listen. One of the reasons that I wanted to back up and talk about the passage that Peter talked about last week is because in that, and we didn't get a lot of time to talk about it, there's this bit that's confusing about binding and loosing. When I forgive someone, like it's, I free them. When you forgive someone their sins, you free them. You let them walk away from a chain of guilt and oppression that they might otherwise feel. But what we're talking about this morning is when you forgive others, you set yourself free. When you forgive others, you set yourself free. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I forgive, if there was anything to forgive, Paul's like... (laughs) I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but we're going to forgive. That's what I know. I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. Family, too often we're unaware of Satan's schemes, and choosing to not forgive is one of the ways that he binds us. The plan of Satan is that we would not forgive when we forgive both people are freed. When we forgive, both people are freed. I've mentioned Wilma Dirksen before. Um, 
if you Google her name, you'll find her story. Wilma Dirksen and her husband, their 13-year-old daughter, was abducted in the 90s. She was missing for several weeks. They finally found her, uh, and she had been abused and killed. And so their story is this. They, somebody came to their door and said, somebody else whose child had been murdered came to their door and said, I heard about what happened, and I want you to know that if you, you will kill yourself if you can't find a way to forgive. This is a, a father who had wrestled with a child being killed for years and years and years and years, and it had eaten him up. It had ended his marriage, and he said, it will kill you if you cannot find a way for, to forgive. And so she said, this guy left their dining room table, and they looked at each other and just said, okay, we're going to figure this out. We're going to find a way to forgive. It took a long time to find the killer. It took a long time to go through the trial. This sculpture that was... Uh, that you see on the screen is her, her husband is an artist. And these two hands that are depicted are, are not his hands bound together. They're his hands bound to the killer of his child's hands. And he did this because he wanted people to understand that when you don't forgive, when, you, when, when somebody else being punished for what you think they owe regardless if it's right or not, when you seek your satisfaction in another person being punished, you've bound yourself to whether or not they get what you think they, need, they deserve. And he, he said it's just, unforgiveness is just bondage. And we can't, like we are binding ourselves, we are putting ourselves in bondage when we won't forgive Number five, you may suffer the consequences of other people's sin. You see, forgiveness is not revisionist history. Forgiveness is not, does not mean that something bad didn't happen, didn't happen to you. And, and like you, like, <laughs> I thought about starting the sermon this morning by saying, people suck. Uh, like, I'm a people, so I, I'm not excluding myself from that. We do things that hurt each other all the time, right? And when people do things that hurt us, we will suffer the consequences and we will experience pain. The king, the billions of dollars were just gone. When he canceled it, they're just gone. You suffer the consequences of other people's sin, but by not forgiving, we're only adding to our pain. By not forgiving, we're only adding to our pain. You will experience the consequences of sin, but it's a choice to forgive. And when we're unforgiving, we're only adding to our pain. So, look, I am saying that you need to forgive because Jesus said that you need to forgive. I know people who have suffered heinous, despicable, awful things. This is not easy. But, I was reminded this morning as I was praying about this, that like Jesus was talking about money with his disciples and the disciples, it's not even this, like money. Money's easy compared to this. His disciples said, who can be saved then? Like nobody, nobody can do what you're saying. And Jesus said, no, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. Number six, you don't wait for others to ask for forgiveness before forgiving them. Both of the servants come and they ask for time. They didn't ask for forgiveness. The king extended forgiveness because he had pity on the servant. He didn't ask for time. He asked, or he didn't ask for forgiveness. He asked for time. And the king, the kingdom of heaven is like, this is a description of the the nat of the character of the king, the nature of the kingdom, and so the goal of its citizens. You and I, as followers of Jesus, are citizens of the kingdom of God. And what this is, is, is a description of the character of the king, the nature of the kingdom, and so the goal of its citizens. Forgiving people doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Forgiving people sets both people free. And so you don't wait for others to ask for forgiveness. The king acts before any repayment has been made. 
before there's an attempt, you can't earn the forgiveness of the debt. That's the lesson of the first servant. The debt is too big. You and every descendant after you until you aren't remembered is put into slavery. But the debt is canceled because the king chose to cancel it. It was just canceled. It was wiped away. Forgiveness involves your heart, number seven. Your heart is either transformed and moved or it is hard and unmoved. Again, this is not easy. The king took pity on the first servant and canceled the debt. The second servant or the servant was unmoved when he saw the pain of his fellow servant. This is about your heart. It is about our character. We'll return to this in just a moment. Lastly, number eight, you don't wait to forgive until you feel like forgiving. And there's a really simple reason for this. When? When are you going to feel like forgiving? I was watching a basketball game yesterday, and the announcer said bad things about my coach. And I, like, I was enraged. And Mindy looks at me and she goes, what are you speaking about tomorrow? And I was like, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. I don't, that was, it was like, he said bad things about Izzo like two years ago. And I cannot stand him because of it. You won't feel like forgiving anytime soon. You just won't. Like, it's why it's an upside down kingdom because it's not something that comes naturally to us. You won't feel like forgiving anytime soon. When, like, what, when the man paid back 30 million work days, is the king suddenly going to go, okay, now? What, 40? Uh, we'll give it another 20,000 years. And then, no, you don't. You either cancel it or you don't. And it's your choice. And it's not because it, you get around to feeling like it. Wilma Dirksen said, uh, I don't remember if someone asked her if she began to process this, but what, was, what would it take? What would, what would give you justice? And her first answer was, well, the killer would have to die. And then she's like, no, that doesn't work. He was guilty. My daughter was innocent. That, those are, they both, that would be both of them dying. That, that's even. That's not, no. Ten child killers would have to die. And she's like, nope, still not good enough. I got to do it. I've got to be the one who executes 10 child killers to get to where I need to go. And she, began to, she said, I began to have fantasies about killing 10 people. And ultimately what she found herself in is the position that Lamech was in. I've got to do this. I've got to be in control. I've got to be the one that's in charge of vengeance. You see, if you can't forgive, what we're ultimately saying is, I have to be the one to hold on to this. I have to be the one to protect myself. I have to be the one that's in control. I have to be the one that is my own rock. I have to be my own refuge. I have to be my own fortress. These are all words that the psalmist used to describe God. But we take those and we think, I've got to do it. You get to the place where your attitude is that where, my attitude is where I need to go, depends on me. I'm bound to this. And lastly, the attitude is simply just this. I'm my own God. I'm my own God. Two weeks ago, I, I mentioned like functional atheism. We just think we're in control. When we don't listen to Jesus, we get to the place ultimately where we're saying, no, God, I've got it from here. You go ahead and do whatever you're going to do, but I am in control when it comes to my life. And that's not a good place for any of us to be in. This parable ends and it says that the servant was handed over to the torturers. And here's what I think the parable is teaching us. You're tortured when you don't forgive. You're simply tortured when you don't forgive. I read this and I usually have the attitude, well, if I get caught, 
then maybe I'll be tortured. No, 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 no. I don't think that's how this works. You are tortured when you don't forgive because Jesus ended and said, this is how your father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's about a heart that is unmoved or not. So we're finishing up chapter 18 this morning and I want to just like, man, Jesus says some incredible things in this one chapter alone, like crazy things. He said that if we don't humble ourselves like children, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is where peace peace exists. And there is no peace where self-righteousness resides. That's what this parable is teaching us this morning. There is no peace where self-righteousness resides. Jesus said, woe to you when you cause others to stumble. It would be better if a millstone was around your neck. Woe to you if you cause others to put their trust in something other than Jesus, it'd be better for you to be drowned in the sea. And as if that's not bad enough, he follows that up with, cut the things that cause you to stumble out of your life. It's better to enter full, abundant, vibrant, zoe life, maimed, than to have your whole body and be thrown into hell. In the middle, because I think he knew we needed it, he reminds us that he's the one who leaves 99 on the hill and goes and looks for one wandering child, one wandering little one who is putting their trust in something other than him. He won't let us be cut off. We can cause binding and loosing with brothers and sisters within the church, within our church family. And finally, Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, this is how your father will treat you. He'll give you over to torture. Now, that is a lot of heavy stuff. That is a lot of, of like, to be honest, I'm a little scared when I read all those things. Because I know that I can't watch a basketball game without like recognizing that unforgiveness is a problem for me, let alone like real life. But Jesus doesn't say this to scare us. You have to understand, Jesus teaches us these things. When, when, when Jesus tells us to be obedient, when he says, my, my mother and my brothers and sisters are those who obey me there take my words and put them into practice what jesus is telling us is that the way to freedom the way to abundant full vibrant life is by obeying him by by doing the very things that we look at and go (laughs) that's not possible and jesus says "No, no no i'm not asking you to accomplish this on your own i'll help you get there but you have to choose to be obedient to jesus Entering the kingdom means experiencing Jesus is faithful, and it means experiencing full life, knowing that Jesus pursues us and desires us to be in his family. We can experience freedom, and it's not freedom to something. We think of freedom as having all the choices we want. That's not freedom. Freedom is being freed from something, and Jesus gives us that kind of freedom, We can experience freedom, not freedom to something, but freedom from something. There is boundless forgiveness in the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, you become truly forgiving when you acknowledge that you are the one with the unpayable debt. This is what got me. You and everyone after you sold into slavery. You and everyone after you sold into slavery, being bound in unforgiveness. And the king says, I'll choose to remember that no more. I'll set you free. I don't want you to spend one day thinking that you can try to pay me back. I don't want you to spend one moment thinking that you're going to have to try to earn your way back it's just canceled and if we don't recognize that that's us then we're going to continue to turn to our fellow servants we're going to continue to turn to our church family and hold them accountable for things that they can't pay 
We become truly forgiving when we acknowledge that we're the one with the unpayable debt, the things that reside in the heart of the vilest offender. I kept thinking of the the old hymn, I think it's To God Be the Glory, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Like the debt is just gone. That's what we're given in Christ. So this morning we're going to celebrate communion. And here's what I want you, like communion is symbolic and so like I could, like we could talk all day about different things that this symbolizes. But when you take the body and blood this morning, when you take the juice and the cup, this is what I want it to symbolize for you. I want you to think about the debt and it's just gone. It's gone. It's canceled. You don't have to spend a single moment trying to pay it back because you can't. Not only that, but you've been freed and all who come after you can be freed as well because you know the way to freedom. All who come after you can be freed as well because you know the way to freedom. It's in obedience to Jesus' difficult words. So there's, we changed it up since we're all in one section. You just exit to your left, go back. And there's a table at the back. You can use both sides of the table to go through the table. There's gluten-free options as well. So I want to say a prayer, and then the ushers will dismiss you so you can go back, receive the elements. Bring them both back to your seat, and Pastor Peter will come up and share some words with us as we take communion together. Back to your seat with the cup and the bread, and we'll take it together. Would you pray with me? God, my heart is so unforgiving. My heart is so unforgiving, and what that is is simply a failure to acknowledge that I need forgiveness as much as anyone. I am no better or worse than any other human being that walks the face of this planet. I have a debt that I can't pay. And to try to pay it would mean forever being (laughs) bound and never finding freedom. And God, you send your son to us, and the debt is simply wiped away. The account is set back to zero. The burden is lifted off of my shoulders. I can stand tall. I can walk freely knowing that you have spoken the words over us that we are your children and you are pleased with us because of what you've done, not because of what we've done. Jesus, would you take our hearts and the things that seem impossible? Lord, I know there are people here. We can list names, God, of people that we're not quite ready to forgive God, I pray that you take that list and I pray that you just go down the list one by one and say, I'll help you. You can take that person off your list and you can take that person off your list and you can trust, we can trust you to take vengeance, Lord, that that we don't have to be in control of caring for ourselves because you've got us. You are watching over us. God, would you give us the strength to choose forgiveness? Would you empower us by your spirit? And as we take communion this morning, Lord, would you remind us that you've simply done everything that needs to be done? Lord, we love you. We give you praise. We ask all of these things in the strong and powerful name of Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, who is seated at your right hand, interceding for us. This is his name we pray. Amen.